Be good to start, Catherine. Yeah, let's start. Um, yeah, so my name is Kerry Backris. I'm the president of RIMS NZ and PI. Um, and we run a whole number of education sessions and networking events. But one of the things that we um, want to also focus on, so we do quite a lot of stuff from a technical point of view, how do you actually do the role um, and sort of risk-related topics and sharing events. But one of the things that we um, have identified is that actually you can have all the technical skills in the world, but if you can't influence individuals to articulate the value of risk and get them on board your journey, um, well, then actually you're not going to be successful in the role. So Catherine um, is a coach and mentor. That's right, eh, Catherine? Yes. Got the right, eh? And Catherine right, and I, yes. it's probably, oh, it seems oh, like... Oh, no, don't life. say the years. <laughs> it seems like a lifetime ago, but we were mentors on the, the University of Auckland Women's Mentoring Programme, um, and we have um, stayed in touch since then. Um, and Catherine has delivered a number of um, events uh, for Rooms NZ. So I've asked her to do this session, particularly to sort of focus on influence, thinking about your stakeholders, thinking about your messages and your channels, channels of communication and how you really get individuals on board your journey. Thanks very much, Catherine. Over to you. Oh, great. Thanks very much. Kerry, I'm very excited about uh, this webinar. Oh, is it a Zoom or webinar? Any seminar, webinar? It's a Zoom, a Zoom meeting. Oh, webinar. Zoom meeting. <laughs> um, because this topic is uh, really integral to um, the work I do around personal branding. The influence and the communication and connection that we have as individuals is hugely powerful. And when we kind of get it right, it opens us up to a really um, position of where we can start to make choices about how we wanna be or how we want others to be. And I'm gonna take you through some of those strategies uh, in relation to both your life. Cause I tend to look at life as one. I don't separate it as personal and professional. Um, I see this is you. And so my intent today in the webinar, or Zoominar, is to help you understand what you can do to be the best person you can be in regard to communication, influence, and connection with others. Um, and a lot of my coaching clients struggle because they want to be this in a professional life and they want their that in a personal life. So just to give you context of how I'm approaching this, it's you. And when you know who you are and what you are all about and how best you want to be, then it gives you that ability to navigate, adapt, be agile and meet the different audiences needs and recognize what they are and deliver value to those different audiences. So let's start. Um, we're going to start with a bit of a discussion. Now, um, I like to, if there's any questions, you can use the chat, which is great. Um, we're going to do a lot of interaction in this. There's going to be some sessions, poll questions, breakout rooms for you to share your thoughts. Uh, if there's anything that comes up and you would like and you have a question, just pop it in the chat. And I have um, Diallo, who's joined us today, my business partner. She's very good at managing chats. So she brings it to attention that um, often when I'm focusing on the webinar, or on the PowerPoint, I forget to look at the chats. So she will bring me into factor. So what we're going to look at influence is the topic. And as Kerry introduced in her lovely introduction, it's really about how to help you understand influence, how to use influence, and how for you to take these strategies from this webinar, seminar, and utilize them to be the best risk manager to deliver the value that you can so that others can understand the value around risk in a professional context. But as I said before, it's also the personal, how you can be the best communicator, connector, and inspire people 
to lead people. So there's a lot of different variables in influence, but let's start with, and I think Kev, um, we'll just do this one. I'm left-handed, so it's very difficult to um, use a right-handed mouse when you're left-handed. I haven't managed to, I, yeah, anyway, so let's go with it. So the first part of the, uh, I'll just close this down a bit. The first, oh, how do we close that? Because it's interrupting, I can't see the chat. That's it, thank you. The first pillar, I suppose, that we're going to look at today is reality. Why? Why should I become a person of influence? And what does that mean for me? What are some of the things that I need to be aware of for me to understand what influence is all about and how it relates to me? The second one is self-awareness. So who am I? What are some of the influences around me that are part of something that I already know, but maybe don't know? And how do I find out what are those influences that are impacting on me building relationships, managing relationships, engagement, et cetera? And the third part is credibility. How influential am I? So those are the three pillars that we're going to be discussing today. The reality, self-awareness, and credibility. So the next uh, thing that we'll move through to is, um, Kerry's already introduced that. So who are we? Well, we're rooms, and uh, we've worked together on a number of webinars, and they've been great. And m to m which is Move to More Coaching and Recruitment. So we're a co coaching company that focuses around personal branding, and we're also a recruitment company that works as recruiters. And the uniqueness about M2M is because we work in a recruiting space and we meet lots of candidates um, and we work with clients around talent, we know the market. And what, how the coaching evolved was we realized that a lot of advice that we were getting from candidates are coming to us. How do I get a job? I'm stuck. I'm at a crossroads. How do I prepare for interviews? That there really wasn't um, a lot of, there was so much information around that it was hard to decipher what would work for these individuals. So we developed online courses, which were actually um, in the process of going live with very shortly. And we're really excited about this. And that's all to help people be their best. It's to understand what is it to have the clarity, to have focus and direction about what I need to be the best person I can be. And that's really the mantra of M2M. So this is me. Um, I am professionally, I have Diala and Anya and I um, went through in COVID a, well, yeah, what's COVID, basically our recruitment business uh, went down the drain. So we sat in isolation with our Zoom and decided what are we going to do? And so we had to reassess who we were and what we were all about and how were we going to get out to, to the market and meet the needs. And that's where the first kind of understanding of what influence can we have to support others to grow and to be able to navigate their way through all the uncertainty. And that's where we started our journey to um, coming up with Move to More, which is what we always said, you can always move to more. And that's, we shortened it to m to m But essentially that's what we want to do is we want to help people move to more, to be the best they can be. Personally, um, I've got, a, this is an older photo. I now have two grandchildren and Anya keeps saying, where are the pictures of the grandchildren? I was like, I know, I need to find them. But I haven't actually, they're from Sweden. My son is in Sweden and he's um, over here at the moment with his family, our two granddaughters. And my daughter is back from LA living with us. Um, yeah, that's been tough living in LA and now you've got to, and she worked on super yachts and now she's living with mum and dad. She's got her own business. She's a bit of an entrepreneur, but living with a mum and dad can be like what's going on in my life. So that's me. Um, and I think that 
one of the um, powerful parts around why I love doing this is because I realized, and after many, many experiences in life, um, particularly in my career, that I was basing a lot of my success on other people's success or what I thought they wanted me to be. And essentially, I was a, round, a, a square peg in a round hole. I just never fitted in. And it took a number of times. I mean, I've been through, I've been fired three times. Um, and it took me the third time. I could just say, Mum, what's what's going on? And I realized that I had a part to play in these experiences because I had no clarity about who I was. And I was making decisions based on what I thought I needed to make. And I would go into roles and jobs that I was very good at presenting myself and they liked it, but the actual role was not me. And so um, it just never worked. And it wasn't until after the third experience, I realized that I actually have a part to play in how I, um, how the experiences in my life are part of me as well. And if I want to change those experiences, I have to change me. And I have to look at who am I? What do I really want? And I have to believe in me. Because if I don't believe in me, then my ability to connect and know what I want is going to be very, it's, I'm just going to keep repeating the same experiences. And I wanted them to stop. So I, it took a long time. It's not a journey. And this is what I, you know, before we start, this webinar is just a little tip. It's just giving you some strategies and tips for you to start thinking, what is it that I need to be to be the best I can be? How do I continue and grow? What is the legacy I want to leave? When I leave the room, what do I want people to say about me? When I'm leading a team, what is it that I want people to say about me as a leader? What are people? So it's very much, and these are the, and this is what I love the most, is because we control how we respond. It's all within our power. It's just that we need to understand what to, strategies we need to use in order for us to, under, to discover how best to be the best we can be. So let's get started. We're all going. Is everybody okay here? So we're going to start with... Um, as I said, you can type in any sessions and things like that. Any questions? The poll question. So here's a poll question for you. Do you know how to use the power of influence in your professional and personal life? Yes, no, or not sure? Just to give me an idea of where you guys are at at the moment. So if you could just answer that quick question. Oh, right. So we've got about a lot of, yeah, 72%, not sure. So this is, an, this is thank you for that. Um, for those who say, have said yes, great, because maybe we'll be able to enhance that. For those who have said no, I, hopefully this webinar will give you a, the ability to understand what strategies and platforms you can build on to be, to use influence to uh, for the best way in your life I'm just reading and not sure we've got 68 percent not sure once again as I said this session is about giving you a foundation starting point for you to build on so let's start with um, the first webinar let's go so we've got lots of screens happening here and the first question is the reality question and we'll just pop that over the, so what's happened? Ah, thank you. That's what I need. So why should I become a person of influence and what does it mean? Now I have to use a, as I said, I'm left-handed. I'm using a right-handed mouse and it is really frustrating. So let's look at some facts. I know you, know you guys like facts. The um, percentage of... And these are some of the facts that we use in our personal branding course, and we talk to our candidates. Of the 75% of adults who Google themselves, nearly half say their results aren't positive. 
So this is what's happening out in the world in regard to um, how influence and your reputation can impact on your career. Eight out of 10 people find their next career opportunity from their network. 85% of recruiters say an employee's online reputation influences their hiring decisions. And we really promote, because it's true, whenever we, we're always searching online for um, candidates, and we always, whenever we look at potential candidates, we always go on LinkedIn and we search social media. I had a situation where I had a candidate who was offered a job and um, the client, and she accepted, and the client came back to me, it was a verbal offer, and said, oh, before we send the formal offer, I've just found this news article about this candidate who had a personal grievance with her uh, previous employer. And it was an article written in the newspaper, in a local newspaper. And when I read it, I thought, oh, my goodness. She said, I just need you to check it out as to what was this was all about. So then I had to ring the candidate and she went, that was meant to be a confidential um, situation. It was never meant to be reported. I didn't even know it was reported. And I said, well, the best thing for you is to make sure that if you have anything online, you do your search, make sure you know what's online about you and have a story ready. And she said, well, I didn't even know. So then we went back to the candidate, uh, the client and explained the situation. And um, she was quite open to discuss it and that was fine. But it was something that you need to be aware because this is your influence as well. It's your reputation, it's where you sit, that people will look for you and search you online. And you need to know what they're saying about you and what is being said about you. Now, the other one that's particularly relevant to you within the business that you're at is reputation damage, is the number one risk concern for business executives around the world. And 88% say they're explicitly focusing on reputation risk as a business challenge. So the world is global, but it's small. And so therefore through social media, you have to be, as a leader, very cognizant of your reputation as a leader and in business. And you have to manage that really well um, because it can impact significantly on your career if something does go wrong. And also it impacts on the business as well. So it has quite a catastrophic effect. Um, it can no longer be quiet and contained because it will get out if a situation happens. Uh, and this is where you really need to be, as a leader, cognizant of the fact that you control your reputation. It's all in your power. And that is where your influence to others and within yourself is key. Once you get and understand that you have the power, you have the power of choice. It's you who decides your reputation, no one else. It's you who decides what people say about you when you leave your room. It's you who decides what people say about you when you're leading a team. You are the key person. You are the one. And that's the beauty because that is the power of what you have. That's the one thing you have. Nobody else can take it from you is you have a power of choice. How you respond is up to you. So your personal brand, and this is how you perceived. And this is kind of a, it's a passion topic for me because it is really the one thing that you can control. And if you can work on your personal brand, understand with clarity, with focus, and have the direction and the confidence and self-belief in you, that is when influence starts to rock for you. Your reputation is how, as I said before, it's the way others see us. So how we are seen is our reputation. What people say about us is our reputation. The next um, is our influence, is what we use to build trust and credibility with others. And so no matter what role you are doing, the fact is influence is built on trust and credibility. And if people trust you and they believe you are credible, they will 
come with you. They will be influenced by you. They will follow you. They will discuss with you. What, uh, oh, hang on, here's a question. When considering your reputation, if you have to take an employer to mediation court you to try to recover you, how does the court count against you with prospective employers? I always believe you control your reputation. So there are such, life is not perfect. There are times when there are people who will not always agree with you. There are people who will put you in situations that are challenging, but the core is your power of choice is how you respond to that. And I've always believed that if you are open and respectful, then that's all you can control. You can't control anything else. How you respond is essentially the power you have to any situation that's difficult. Reaction is the negative aspect. When you react, you don't have control. When you respond, you have that control because you choose how to do it. And the next part of the personal brand is, of course, the power of choice, which to me is all connected to reputation, influence. The power of choice is we choose what we want to be remembered for. We choose how we want to interact. We choose how we want people to think about us or what they want to say about. We choose our behavior is in our control. And that is when you start to discover that when you understand and have clarity about who you are and the power that you have and belief you have in you, then you are able to take that and be the person you want to be and to have the influence and to build the connection and to manage the relationships because you choose how you respond. The power of choice is one of the most Oh, I think that for me, I, when I understood how to have the power of choice and how to utilize it, now one important word that uh, is a very simple word that goes along with the power of choice is and. So often we are faced with it either has to be this or this or either this or either that. When you use and, it brings unity. So you can have both. It's just managing and understanding how to have both. So when you're looking at a situation, when you're leading a team and there are different personalities and those different personalities are not um, aligned with each other, rather than separate the different personalities, Look at ways that you can bring these different personalities together where you celebrate the difference as a collective unity to moving and achieving the goal. So, for example, I'm an extrovert, right? Vision, strategy, I love that space. My business partner, Diella, hi there, Diella, is structure, process, and very detailed. I get her to check everything, check it, check it, check it. Now I can do it, but my energy doesn't sit in her space and her energy doesn't sit in my space. Our superpowers are not where we want to play. And then I've got Anya, who's like the how, she implements, she go implement, 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 implement. She'll look at the technical side. We celebrate each other's differences because we have a common goal to deliver the best services we can to help others move to more. And when you know where you play best, then you can bring in, and this is where influence comes in, others to help you and the team collectively be the best. So instead of dividing difference of personality and strengths, give the team a cohesive um, solution to being the best team, that you actually, difference is celebrated because it, it under, difference brings the ability to look at things in a way which um, could take you outside of where you traditionally look. So if you have the same people, same personalities, same, you don't want a lot of me. 
in a meeting. You want me in a certain meeting where you're having to do big ideas, get the energy going, get people up and ready for a big, if you've got a project, you want to get people involved, you want to bring me in and I can do that. But you don't want me to come in and draw up the project plan. You want to leave that up to a person who has that ability and delivers it well. So together, unified, we achieve the common goal. So when you are having a conversation where you have a rep, yeah, where you have how I'm trying to think, where you have people who are extroverted, figure out there's three kind of ways in which you can do it. It's the why. I'm a why person. I, I go up into the space. There's the what is the strategy. It's putting the strategy together. And then there's the how is the implementation. So if you take Diella, myself and Anya, when we're having, let's look at the business. How far can we go? What would that look like? I'm the one that leads that conversation. I'm the one that leads that meeting. And I say to Diella and Anya, do not ask me what questions or how questions, because that will shut me down. When you are looking at the what, Diella, that's what you do. We have a meeting. What will it look like? What's the strategy? If we choose on that idea or concept that you have, Catherine, Diella's role is what? The strategy and putting that together. It's the education piece. She, and I help her with that, but essentially she'll do it. Pass it. We have a how meeting. Anya looks at the strategy. She looks at the vision and she goes, this is how we do it. But we own, and I don't ask a why question in a how meeting. And Diella doesn't ask a what question in the how meeting because that's where um, Anya shines. She looks at how are we going to implement this? What will it look like? What are some of the strategies that we need to start with first? What are some of the issues around it? So what often, happen, what often happens is as leaders is that we don't, and this comes back to us, an understanding self, is if we don't know who we are and where we best deliver value, often we find ourselves in situations that we're not the best in, but we keep pushing at it. We keep going at it because we think we have to be in there rather than identifying someone who says, you're better at it than me. You go do it because you've got... I've got the concept, but that's where I play best. You and the team are really good at the strategy. Put it together. Let's work together. And you, Anya, implementation. You know how to implement. You're far better at it than I am. So that's where you, um, the why, the what, and how. That is a strategy around influencing your team to unify them towards a common goal is to celebrate those differences as a way to achieving the goal or the outcome. So <clears throat> I hope that's helpful, guys. Yeah, can you give me a clap or a, am I on, you know, it's like why, what, how? <laughs> Great. So I've got a definition of influence and I read to Britannica because I thought, well, you know, they must know what they're talking about. So, and I liked it. I thought what they, how they presented influence is um, in the sense of how they presented it here is really succinct. So influence is the power to change or affect someone or something. It's the power to cause changes without directly forcing them to happen. A person or thing that affects someone or something in an important way. Now, I had an interesting, um, a couple of years ago, about two, three years ago, it was before COVID, I was walking down um, Albert Street past the court, and I used to be a secondary school teacher, and I was with a few, a couple, two clients, and we were walking down towards um, the, one of the hotels down there, I don't even know, it's the Sheraton, I think, no, it wasn't, anyway, the Stamford, I think, and um, we came past the court and we were standing at the intersection lights waiting to cross. And this person came, I could hear them 
and they were calling out, Miss, Miss. Now, I was a teacher 25 years ago. So that's a long time. And I could hear this, Miss, Miss, Miss. I was like, what the heck's going on here? I was like, who's that? And I sort of stood there and thought, is that me? And then this woman came and just gave me a big hug and said, is that you, Miss? And I was like, who? And I had no idea who she was. And she went, it's me, Natasha. Now, I haven't seen her since 1990. Right. So that's a long time. And I was like, Natasha? She goes, Miss, how I, I thought it was you. You still look the same. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, she, she said, I'm here in court. And I went, oh, are you at going to, you know, court? Have you done something? She goes, no, 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 no. It's, it's no, 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 no. She said, it's my brother. I'm here to support him. He never had you as a teacher. He never learned from you what I learned about the vehicle to success. <laughs> you were my vehicle to success. And I'm sitting there thinking, I dimly remember her, but she remembered in fifth form when she came into my class in, six, in um, school C at that time. And I said to the class, I'm your vehicle to success. Hop on board this vehicle and I'll get you where you want to go. You've got three chances to stay on board. On the third chance, you're off. And so she remembered that 20, whatever, 20 something years later. And I was like, oh my God. And these guys, and the clients turned to me and they said, Did you? She listened to you at that age and remembered that message, the vehicle of success. And that's what changed her life and I was like oh <laughs> I had no idea no idea that that one sentence the vehicle of success was enough to capture her and get her on board and I said you did get school C English she said yeah yeah, yeah I got an A I was like yeah that's right I remember now so those are the moments that we don't even know um, have an impact on people's lives that if we don't take the time to know who we are and how we want to be in the world, um, it, it just we just don't know the, how we can make a difference to someone's life by kind deed or kind words. Sorry, Catherine, can I add? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I, and I think in the converse, um, the, power of, the power of our words and how we can negatively impact an individual is just as just as um, important. Absolutely, and we're going to deal with that very soon. So you're right. The power of words can be the positive or the negative, and that's what we have to be very careful about. So um, this is. Had anybody heard of Dale Carnegie? How to win friends and influence people. This to me was my life changing book. I don't know how I like I think it's 1930 he wrote it or something I've still got it I've got it at home actually I was going to bring it out and show it to you but I left it at home this book I think just simplified how we can connect and interact and build trust and credibility with people in a way that's just simple I mean it is the language is a little bit outdated but actually what he talks about is very simple. It's to the point and it is relevant today. I think one of the things that we, we get sucked into is the complexity that if something's so simple, it has no value. And often we miss the opportunity of that and we try to complicate it um, in a way that, you know, I think we go, and the internet has an issue with that because we have so much choice that when we go to search information, um, it just, we bombarded by it. But my, this book, I think changed and this one sentence, talk to someone about themselves and they listen for hours, which was for me was like, wow, if you really want to be engaged and you really care, then talk to someone and ask them about them. Ask them, find out their story. And that's why I love stories. I love finding out people's stories because to me, that's connection. 
it's like, oh, right, tell me a story. Even when we talk to candidates, I don't want to look at you. I don't look at CVs. I'll, bru I'll read them, but I want to know your story. How did you get here? Why are you interested? What is it about you that brings you to this role? Why are you interested in applying? How do you think you'll land that? What was it that you do that's unusual? What is it that you bring? And to get into who they are rather than the, just the CV is what I love about recruitment is meeting people and hearing their stories. And what people tell you, you is mind boggling what they've achieved and the way and it's like they understate it. Well, once they start telling the story, then you start to bring out, these are the qualities that you actually bring. I mean, you know, the, the story of one candidate who climbed uh, Mount Everest, but it wasn't climbing Mount Everest, it was a journey to get to Mount Everest to climb it that was inspiring. And what she had to go through, it was like, oh my God, that's amazing. So, and the more she talked about her story, the more I, she was going, oh yeah, that is pretty amazing. I thought, I can't believe it. And that's what you focus on. If you want to talk about challenges and how you overcame challenges, talk about your challenges that you have dealt with and how you overcame them. Don't separate them into what you think they want to hear about work. Talk about you because that's who you're bringing to the party. So the um, how to win friends and influence people is, um, yeah, still today the best, one of the best books, I believe in the power of um, influence. So there are, and is coming back to Kerry, two faces of influence. We have manipulation versus inspiration. So I'm focusing on inf inspiration, inspiring influence, but we also do fall, and we are manipulated in today's society. It comes around how the language of influence is used, particularly if you look at marketing, if you look at um, politics, um, the whole political scenario is around the manipulation of getting people on board with certain um, political strategies. There's a whole dynamic around that. And we do, as Kerry said, our words, we can either choose them to be inspiring or we can choose to manipulate and destroy. They can be powerful. Our words are part of um, the left and the right brain. So basically what we have with manipulation is around how we manipulate emotion, information or use information to manipulate emotion. And um, I think that Manipulation, which sits in the left hand, is around the language, is very tangible, whereas in the right, it's the, the right side of the brain is the emotions and feelings is not so tangible. It's not tangible. You feel it, but the effects and impact on it are more powerful when you are inspiring. So when you're inspiring, try to use language that connects to the emotion of the right-hand brain. It's the inspiration side. But when you're using language that is, that is connected to the manipulation side, then you know that you are not gonna get the results you want. And how do you know this? You'll feel it and you'll watch people's reactions. If you're not aware of how people are reacting to you, if too many people are nodding, you know you're in trouble because you should be creating an environment where people put their hand up and say, don't understand what you're talking about. I don't think that's right. Because those are the people you wanna hear. So you wanna encourage the feelings, the security where people feel emotionally safe, where they feel that they can put up their hand and challenge you in a way that's constructive. When you feel that, when you're using language, and I had a situation many years ago where a senior manager in front of um, the, in the lunchroom, it was in a government department, in the lunchroom, came up and verbally abused his PA because she'd done something wrong. Nobody, including myself, got up 
and challenged him on that behavior. Nobody. And I thought that was like, oh my God. And I'd just come out of teaching at that stage. And I looked at it and I thought, you know what, if that was a classroom, I would have stepped up and said, nah, I'm not accepting that behavior in this classroom, get out or whatever. That if I was in it, but I never did because everybody around me was not saying anything. So I thought, well, I better not say anything because this is how they do it. So that's what you want to avoid if you're in a situation in a leadership role. I think you need to be very aware of how people respond to you. Also, the agenda of how you appear, you have control of that. What I mean by that is. You have control about how you present. If you are feeling stressed, if you are feeling agitated, if you are feeling your emotions rising, your body will send you signals. If you ignore those signals, you know you're in trouble because you will react. If you understand strategies to manage those single signals, that is taking the time, emails, you know, an email comes in, not liking it. And I'm sure many of you know this. Take the time, choose, leave a few minutes rather than respond straight away. It can be 24 hours before you respond if you're that angry. Whatever it takes, understand what strategies you can use for you to be able to respond in a way that you choose to respond that is beneficial for the outcome. So um, now those people who came on the webinar, I talk about the trust equation because this is another context of um, important to influence. It's another, I don't know, what do, what do you call it? The diagram, I don't know. But the trust is made up of various aspects and it's all important to you, your reputation and building your personal brand. And I talked about this in the previous webinars with um, the other participants, both in the strategy one and I think in the results one. And I'm bringing it up again because I just believe that when you understand the elements of what makes up trust, then you'll get a good sense of how to um start building the trust factor for you in regard to influence so your credibility are your words and it relates back to what kelly um kerry said in the sense of be choose your words carefully make sure that and once again understand where you're at personally and where your emotions are at because your response is guided by you so it how you respond is entirely up to you. So choose your words. So your credibility is comes through your words. Are you qualified? Do people believe you to be the person you want them to be? You want, you want them to think you are. So if you want to be a leader who's got a, a, a leading a team that's unified, that's achieving, that's feeling safe, that's facing challenges in a way that is positive, that is growing, that is developing, then are you the person to best lead that? And that comes down to the question they will ask is, do you have credibility? Are you qualified? Are you rel reliability, your actions? Are you a reliable, can we trust you? Yeah, there it is. Your reliability is the factor of trust. So are you reliable? Do you deliver consistently in regard to the actions that demonstrate that you are trustful or you are trusting? Do you do what you say or do they do what they say? And the next one is, um, sorry, is I can't quite see it because I haven't known about the chat is safety. And this is what I was saying before, emotion. So do people feel safe around you? Do they feel they can come to you? I had a manager who um, it was a GM actually called me into her room. Well, she had this open door policy where you could go and share. And I was having a difficulty with my direct manager. So I went to share with her some of the difficulties I had. And she had actually gone to the team and said, I have an open door policy and, uh, you know, come and I'll share it with you. 
I'll be happy to hear what you have to say in, in confidentiality, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to her, and before I went in, I thought, mate, oh, I'm not too sure that this is right. But she said it. So that was a reliability. I wasn't sure, but I went ahead because I thought, well, she had said it. And she, you know, and that's, if she wasn't going to do it, she wouldn't have said it to the whole team. And so I went in there. Little did I know that, and her desk was facing the window and the door was at the back. So she had to turn around. That's the first sign. Her back was to the door, not inviting. But I went ahead, went in, and she turned and she looked at me and she said, and her face was white and she just hung up the phone. And she said to me, oh, you're here for that meeting, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I've come to, you know, talk, which you said was okay. She said, yeah, yeah. She said, well, I've got five minutes. What do you want to know? What do you want to say? And then I thought, oh, my God. So what I did, and she just was not in the right space and she just started lost her lost it and what I didn't realize is before I walked in she had just found out her husband had rung her and they were he was leaving her now what did she do did she say to me no this is not the right time right now do you mind coming back no she went ahead because she felt obliged and it wasn't until years later she came up to me and apologized but it was because she just didn't understand what the obviously a terrible situation, but she didn't have that self awareness to manage herself and her response by being open and just saying, "Look, it's not the right time. I've just had some terrible news. Can you come back or let's deal with it right later?" Which would have been fine, but she persevered because she felt responsible because she was the GM and she said she would do it. And I said, "Yeah, but it was the nightmare of a session." And I had to leave because she was just so upset. And I had no idea. And it wasn't until years later that she came and told me. And I went away from that thinking, well, actually, I left not long after. So those are little things that indicate to you, you know, just be aware of how you position yourself. And do I feel safe opening up to them? And what is the motive? What, are the, what is the focus that we're, is it about, is it me or are they focused on themselves? These are the questions that people you're working or influencing or communicating or building relationships. These are the questions they're asking in regard to trust. So your circles of influence are the others. So what we're looking at here are some strategies or frameworks that can help you just sort of frame up how do I start to become more of an effective influencer how do I start building more influence so that I'm achieving uh, better outcomes for my team so that I'm professionally achieving the results I want in my career and personally as well and the thing that one has to it's a self-awareness which we're dealing with at the moment but it's also understanding that it's a journey that, and I think I said this earlier, you can't just boom like this. It's actually a journey of, and it's commitment and it's um, being committed to being the best person and taking that journey to deciding how am I best going to do it. So the circle of influence is who you are and what you do. Your audience is what they want and need. And that's where your influences sit. So when you're working with a team, it's identifying what they want and need. Your influence sits in that part, but the key part is you, who you are and what you do. And that doesn't change. Who you are and what you do, no matter what audience you are spending time with, or engaging with or building relationships, your influence is centered around you. It can change, it can adapt, it can be different personally. For example, if you think of your audience as your team, your influence is going to be more in that leadership, it's going to be in that team leadership, it's going to be in unity, 
but the core of how you influence sits with you. As a parent, your influence is going to be different in the sense of you, how you parent, how you um, raise your children, how you communicate, how you build the relationship, but the core doesn't change. The core is still you. You'll just bring different skill sets and different communication strategies and different agendas and different words and different ways of engaging to identify what your audience needs and to deal and to and to meet that. So a lot of people just say, and I remember as a and you know as a teacher, I mean I could walk into a um, a, a assembly six, 700 kids. I could walk in there and have them quiet just by looking at them and counting, going like one, two, three, silence. That was like, whew, and, they, and people say, how did you do that? And I was like, I don't know. They just do it. But they knew me. And so I was, it didn't come over, you know, I built that reputation up. So they knew me. And when I was a DP, they knew how I operated. So when I walked on that stage, they knew that within three seconds, one, two, three, quiet. When it came to my children, I just, I was like, what happened? I was still operating on a teacher side, dealing with a two-year-old having a tantrum in the supermarket blew my mind. I just, I was like, what? I'm good at controlling children. <laughs> I'm good at, I can do this. Why isn't my listening to me? And I really struggled with that because I was used to telling, you know, used to leading, used to inspiring, used to with children. And when I came to my own, no, nah, they weren't interested, especially when they were young. What do you mean you're not going to sit? What do you mean when I say no? And I took, it took me a lot of time to adjust, to understand that my influence was very different with my children than it was with the children I um, were teach, was teaching. And the difference of influence with my team as a deputy principal was very different but it was still me. And I was, what I was trying to do was be the same with all audience and all um, target audiences. And it wasn't working. And it was highlighted with my, with my children, particularly when they were young and allowing them to express themselves was quite difficult for me for a while there. And so I had to go and get parenting help to understand that I had to change the way I influence them in a way that was going to allow them to be, you know, feeling like they were growing and I was feeling like I was influencing them in a more positive way rather than struggling with them. So I learned great techniques like avoiding screaming matches in the supermarket by letting them put the lollies in the supermarket trolley. And then when we got to check out, putting them to the side <laughs> so they didn't see those little strategies whereas when I say no what do you mean everybody when I say no you don't do it no so that was just one of the things that I learned around that influence part so now we're going to go into breakout rooms and this is where you're going to share with your um, different participants I think we're going to go into groups of about four or five and you're going to have maybe eight minutes. And I'd like you to choose uh, a person to report back to just quickly. Um, somebody who can write down a few uh, notes or maybe even remember them. And what I'd like you to do is discuss what your circles of influence are, you believe to be. And what you believe those attributes are in regard to those circles of influence. So, for example, as I said, you know, at business as a team leader, what you believe your attributes are in that circle of influence. As a parent, what you believe those your attributes are in that circle of influence. So, for example, if you're if you're as a team, what is it that your team need and how do you influence that and what are those attributes about you know, how you influence is it your ability to communicate is it your ability to build trust and with in your personal life what are some of those circles of influence that you have 
and how do you, what are those attributes that you use? So we're going to go into rooms now. Um, I think around 30 seconds, you'll get a little timer that will say room closing, and then you'll come back to the meeting and we'll just get people to share some of their thoughts around that and have a bit of a discussion around that. So we're gonna do that now and off you go. We all joined. Yep. You're joining, fabulous.
Yeah, how do I get people to talk? Hi guys. We're all back. All back. Uh, we're all back. Yep. Thanks for that. I just um, wanted to give you some time to share with others that are attending the session. And I thought what would be good, we've got, we're a bit tight on time. I've been told off here. It's like you give to me. I was like, okay, okay. Um, and so what would be great is if you just the person that you've elected just to report back very quickly um, the circles of influence that you discussed and what you believed the attributes were. Uh, if you remember your groups, let's start with group one. Who was the person that's been elected in group one? Have we got group one there? Are we group one? I'm not sure. I think you are. Did I think, you it, was, I think it was us. Was it us, guys? Yes, yes it was. Yeah. <laughs> Alicia, yes, it was. Christine, Diella, and Gary. There we go. Um, look, we had a great chat, and we were, uh, we didn't even, sorry, we didn't kind of elect a, a spokesperson, but I'll just take it on board very quickly. Um, what you do. Thank you. Yeah, we just had a great chat about him certain people of influence of my oh my things not on certain people of influence um in our life um now you know gary had someone who was um you know really important in his life who shared his struggle with alcoholism yeah. um in the workplace so you know something like you cat and where you don't hide what's going on like you've been fired three times this guy was a recovering alcoholic and he didn't hide it and, you know, because of that, it created a really open and trustworthy environment um, for Gary. And, you know, he ended up becoming really good friends with this person. This person has been quite a large influence in his life. Um, Alicia had um, somebody that she worked closely with um, in the US who um, sort of became a mentor to her. Um, and has, you know, I think the common theme is that the attributes is that, you know, someone in your um, work life can also be a friend and that's happened sort of for all of us um, and I suppose my, my person of influence was you Catherine oh thank, so, you. thank um, you I didn't pay you by the way the common, <laughs> the common theme is that you know we've all got people in our lives who have you know made an impact and and also um, been a huge influence um, and have become originally work colleagues but have become friends as well Fabulous. Hey, that's great. Thanks. Um, and let's group room two was as Azamat or Stephanie. Which one would you? Uh, I probably will start talking okay. with Stephanie. Ed, Ed uh, it's Azamat. Hi, team. Hi. Um, so we, what we actually, yeah, we we spoke around the question and we were trying to understand what we really need to talk about, but we end up actually talking about how um, who are actually our who's in our circle of influence or who are we actually uh, our immediate sort of um, people who we usually uh, interact with and uh, what are the attributes and I basically because Steph and I we work together I end up actually giving her compliment for the way wow. how she influences the, the people with the uh, it's very easy to talk to Steph and you know it's it's uh, people are usually attracted to her because, um, you know, it, she finds the topics to, to, to talk to people. And I think that's, that's how she influences her circle with, um, with, with making the conversation easy to, uh, to step in and have a chat and so on. So, yeah, that, that was sort of our discussion around that. Fabulous. Hey, that's great. Thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, the next one was Ian and Kerry. There. You were just two of you for some reason. Um, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just great. Yeah, no, that, that, um, for me, you know, um, as everybody saw, I posted that question about, um, you know, the employer having to take them to mediation. That's actually yeah. happened to me twice. And it really impacted me with my um, self-confidence. Yes. And um, when I came to do my rooms, um, certification it was actually Kerry believe it or not who was a great influence in helping me to start that final decision to actually sit the exam I never met Kerry before and just reached out and that's that's actually been 
um, one of the key things for me is, is being able to identify the people that can actually help influence you that you can then go on and influence others. Others, exactly, which is, which is where that the, uh, the power of influence when used in the way to help, and it's about serving others, is hugely powerful. It's like, when you get mm. that, I think yeah. it's um, a much easier way to look at how to be the best you can be is how can I serve others? I think that one mm. question is that That's you ask right. yourself is really a, a key, a foundation question, really. Um, the next um, sorry, can I quickly add? So oh, the yeah. other thing that, that we were talking about is that we're currently recruiting for one of the roles in our team and we've had a number of people apply. But um, the the one participant is sort of, so we've been asking questions, obviously, of all the applicants. And the one question was, well, you know, how do you, you know, if you've got an issue and how do you raise it with a person? And the answer was, well, um, I'll tell them um, why they're wrong and go, well, <laughs> I'm not quite sure that that's going to influence them to, to and be for them to be motivated to change, you know, and, and how it is that actually the whole sort of um, decision about whether she will be um, recruited or not will be based on her ability to, you know, develop relationships, engage, influence. So as you say, Catherine, I mean, like your, um, your reputation um, precedes you and it's really difficult, I think, to change your reputation once it is that it's been damaged yes um it's it's almost like trust you know it takes years and years to build that can be broken in two easy steps i think it can be and that is a reality i mean i think for me you know being fired three times has become i've turned it around because i've accepted that i played a role in that mm -hmm. I, I i definitely without a doubt played a role in those experiences and I think once that's self-accountability and it's also understanding that that was part of my journey, it had to happen for me to get to where I am and where I want to go. And I think that it's the mindset that you have of self and that, um, but at the time it was horrifying. I was so, and three times, I mean, how does that happen? <laughs> when I look back, it was obviously the universe telling me you know, you just, you know, I was self-sabotaging myself because I wanted to be like other people. I wanted to fit in and I wanted to be that success that I saw around me. And I just did not realize that by doing that, I was self-sabotaging my life. Mm -hmm. And even it took three times for me to finally get it. So I think that yeah, that, that we do make mistakes, but we turn them into the positive about us growing and us being, I mean, the more people, and we'll look at this in a minute, but the more people connect with you is when you tell your story. And the more vulnerable you are is the more powerful you become. And that's the connection part of it. But for a long time, I hid it. I was like, and now it's, it's part of my story. Thanks for that. That was wonderful. Thanks, Kerry. And we've got uh, Helen, Louise, and Pyra, Pyria, Pyria. Going to share. Hi, Catherine. How are you? Hi, I'm well. Thank you, Helen. Um, so I um, in the breakout room with Louise and Priya, we, we actually had a discussion around um, how we drew on our previous previous experiences. Um, from uh, our previous jobs, our current jobs as managers and previous jobs as managers. And actually yep. it's sort of a, a bit of a crossover that we had with also our work life, um, having younger children or adult children. Yes. Um, some of the attributes that you sort of would use in both scenarios, um, we discussed um, listening, um, empathy, um, adapting to different working styles, um, understanding our audience and environments, and tasks that we can um, directly and directly and indirectly influence and also yep. kindness and respect. Yes, yeah, so we just sort of um, broke down into some of those topics That's and fabulous. having work and home, they sort of like go hand in hand. Yeah. We just probably do. use a different tone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the work one's easier. Oh, yeah. You know, really. oh. <laughs> Some uh, Diella and I, because Diella's got young children, mine are older, but and Anya's got just about to have a baby in two weeks' time. I was praying 
that she wouldn't go into labor today. Because I said, <laughs> do not go into labor today, please. But I mean, we all talk about coming to work because it's kind of a rest in some ways. Yes. And I guess over the lockdown period, a lot of that sort of work and home did merge, didn't it? Yes. And that was it. Yeah. That, that's the other um, situation that we all had to face was how do we manage? And it was tough. I, I think mm. that, yeah, for a lot, particularly women, and we talked about that in our previous um, webinar, uh, the Zoom ceiling that you just, mm. and the zigzagging where you're working and you're at home and you're doing things and getting lunch and everybody, it was just, and Diala, we're going to do actually a podcast on that, Diala. I'm just suddenly realized, you get there, Diala, you got that. I look <laughs> but we're going to, to share it. our experiences of it because it was, oh my God, Diala had a notice. What was it that you said outside your door? Because your office is in your kind of your bedroom. What was it? You had interview in process or something? I've actually got oh. it here because I don't, oh, where is it? I've got it. <laughs> Can show everyone. Can you see this? Mum is going. It says, "Mum is going live. Do not enter under any circumstances." But you know what? Dad can help. Love, Mum. <laughs> That's good. I, I put my headphones on. That's my way of oh, working. Right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's great. Thanks a lot, Helen. And lastly, uh, is it Rajiv? Oh, because Jess had to go. Sorry, Jess had to go. Are you willing? Are you okay to share there quickly? Nope. That's okay. That's cool. Hey, we're we're under pressure here because we've got time. I'm getting the hurry up, Catherine. Hurry up. So, what do we like to move on to, which connects into this previous um, the breakout room and the questions, is the self awareness around what influences me, and. Um, this book by Robert Caldini, our evidence of what people truly feel and believe comes less from their words than from their deeds. And he's written a fabulous book, which I recommend you read because I'm going to deal with seven principles of the power of influence he talks about. But if you really want to understand the, um, his thinking around the power of influence, his book, is really, really good. And it is called um, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. And he came, he comes up with seven principles. And these are the principles to which you uh, can use when looking at how do I influence? What are some of the psychological connection points that I can use to help me influence and grow and connect and build trust. And um, his first one is the principle of reciprocation, which the human, if you do a good deed for someone, someone feels responsible to respond to reciprocate. And that's the whole dynamic. It's an ancient human um, psychological attribute is the principle of re reciprocation. So as it came through with our last discussion with Ian is about serving others. So good, doing good deeds for others is the best way for you to start influencing and connecting. And that is coming to networking. You know, people go, oh, I don't want to network. I hate networking. And people like coach and that. I'm not networking. And it's not about you going out there and saying, hi, here's my um, business card and finding, you know, they had this date, speed, networking, and all this thing. It's actually understanding how can I help others? What can I do to help others? And once you start understanding that concept of reciprocate, people will respond. And that is where you can go and ask advice, or that is where you can share, that is where you can start to have influence. The other is the principle of commitment and consistency. That is that you demonstrate a commitment and you deliver consistently. Uh, the other is the principle of social proof. And this is where the media, social media has a big part to play. Um, if you go on LinkedIn, those recommendations are the proof about you can talk about who you are and what you do and the value you deliver. 
but the principle of social proof actually enhances that credibility. And we always say when we're working with people around their LinkedIn program, profile is your recommendations are key to your social proof. If people are recommending you and putting a name to those to your recommendations, then that is your social proof. And we have had people get jobs. I had a, um, a client who actually got a role, her role, um, through her recommendations on LinkedIn. So it's really important that uh, you look at that social proof and where you can best develop um, that reputation in regard to your social proof. The next one is the principle of liking. People, humans, like to be liked and they like to feel it, there's a similarity in that. So um, what it is is connecting with that and finding that likeness in your team. So it's coming up with something like, what is it that we like to do together? You know, is team building, if you come up with an idea of concept of team building, I don't, I, I talk about connecting, engaging. I use another word, team building to me is like, but how do we, what are we kind of the things that we like to do? And that's where you um, look at the concept of co-creation or collaboration is that you as a leader collaborate with your team to come up with the outcome of how best we can do it to achieve this or how best can we gather. The other one is the principle of authority that people, and it comes back to that trust equation, the credibility, the actions, those three factors that you actually consistently deliver that you actually have the authority. And once again, it comes back to your social proof as well. The principle of scarcity. Now this is interesting. So what it has a kind of manipulation thing to it, but really it is, is making sure, that it's encouraging, for example, it's the, the aspect of having a team that is excellent, that you are the best team. And that if you don't hold on to that, by keep doing the things you're doing, you'll lose it. So it's actually looking at enhancing that unity of the team by saying, we don't want to lose it. We don't want to lose. So how do we bring and how do we grow? Because once we have that principle of scarcity operating, then it starts to disintegrate. Now that's very, and also when you're looking to recruit and bring into a team, you make sure that you want to make sure that you're bringing in the right elements to that team because one person wrong recruit i heard this thing that's best to recruit no one than anybody like that <laughs> you can't find anyone don't recruit them if you can't find the person that you want don't recruit because that person that you rush to recruit can actually destroy the team not to say they're bad but they're just not part of that um, cohesive team that you've created and the principle of unity is the language of we so it's bringing in the we the co-creation and the collaboration that is how can we together achieve this even with your you know within the family within your personal it's people connect and it influence when you use the language of we how can we do that so these seven, he gives lots of examples in the book, but these seven principles are really key to understanding how to use them in order to build your influence and engage and create the, um, yeah, the kind of relationships that you want to achieve both personally and professionally and personally. And cognitive bias, we're going to have to... Um, this is a huge thing on how we, and I've identified the ones, there are four. These are my top four. Negatively bias is that it's already bad. And why I'm looking at cognitive bias is because, and you can go and do some work around this, is because it influences how we make decisions. 
it influences our search for information it influences how we interpret information and it influences how we remember things and the cognitive bias there are many elements of it but i think when you like i have here identified um the biases that i seem to sort of lean to when under pressure has helped me once i know that it's like oh okay the curse of knowledge this is an interesting one it's because i know too much i don't need to learn it so it's kind of like okay so i already know that and it's actually no stop is this interpreting is this affecting how I look at the situation because I already know it inside out. Does that other person understand it? I mean, and the other one is why don't they get what I know? I know how many times do I have to tell them, you know, they just don't get it. And it's these kind of biases that don't, do impact on the ability to make decisions and how you influence others. So, how influential am I? Is the next, and we have a workbook which we're going to send out to you, and this. The next bit is the credibility. And this is your journey. So in the workbook are exercises, and I'm just going to take you through the snippet of these exercises, which is about how do I build credibility and how influential am I? And um, there's a series of questions in the workbook, which you will work through, and I'm just going to take you through them. But this, the credibility part is your journey. <laughs> it's for you to start deciding how am I going to best do this and how influential do I think I am well that's the first question you need to ask and there are questions in this workbook is where you are rate yourself and you give an example as to why you think you're that and so there's a level of contribution to other people's success my likability and this is where you have to be very honest because if you are one, that's fine. Five, you can, you've got the opportunity to move to five. And if you are five, that's great. How do you be better? So is cognitive bias, is something in there, you know, you had those self-reflection questions to ask yourself. Ability to consistently deliver value, especially when times are tough. So what is my, and that's the honesty question, to deliver that value when times are tough for me? And the question I'd like you to quickly answer is how influential do you think you are? One to five. One is low and five is high. Just a quick poll here. Just like we can just see the first step to self-reflection. Okay, yep. Great, Ex exactly where I expected you to be as professionals, <laughs> as being mature. <laughs> um, that's great, that's the great starting point. So I think we've got, yep, you, everybody's ready for a little bit more growth in that field and I think that's fabulous. And I think that that's a first step for you to decide what I do next. Do I want to start building my influence? Do I want to understand how best to do that? And so the next question in the handbook is how influential do others perceive me to be? And this is the one where you got to go out, if you choose, and ask why we get other people to give you feedback on you is because you've got 20 seconds to make a great first impression. And knowing how to present your brand or your story gives you the opportunity or the leverage and opportunity to influence and entice your audience. In 20 seconds, people will make a decision about you. So you've, and that's where you set your agenda before you go into the room. You take yourself, my sense of, you know, every time I coach, every time I'm in a meeting, I always take a step back and think, where am I? in my head right now where do I want to be take three deep breaths 
and go for it. Because if I don't clear my mind, I will take that with me. And what people feel in that 20, se 20 seconds is your energy or how you make them feel. You don't even know it consciously, how you dress, how you come into that room and what you bring with you is what the people feel in 20 seconds. And then your influence as a leader. These are the sort of the number one skills in leadership around influence, help, ability, helping people to do what they can't, fun, encouraging results without highlighting the goals every single day, motivation, help people love what they hate. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of that cold scarcity thing. I mean, yeah. And that's where the unity comes in. There are things that we are going to do that we're going to hate. But we've got people who love it and people who don't like it. And it's appreciating that, you know, there are moments where people will love doing stuff and people won't. And it's bringing that and, and promoting that as being a positive. Helping, translation is really important in leadership, is helping people understand their roles and contribution. Often, you know, they go to the JD and we get this all the time. In recruiting, I do not hand out the JD until I've spoken to a candidate. People, candidates ring and say, can you send the JD? I'm not receiving your JD. I want to talk to you first and tell you about the role. And then when you want to apply, I'll send you the JD and you can adjust, you know, set your CV and cover letter to the, J, to the JD when you understand it. So that translation part is really important because that comes under the intention of influence. Your connections are important. Eye level contact, really important. Even in tough times, even in difficult conversations is keeping your eyes connected at eye level. The moment your eyes start to distract, which my, I, that was a big thing for me. When I feel under pressure, I, my eyes go all over the place. So I have to bring it back. Vulnerability, the key, is being self-responsible and accountable. You don't have to know everything. You, do, you know what you're good at, but you bring in others together as a team, that unity context, you achieve great things. You will never achieve anything alone until you bring in a team and achieve it together. And when you step up and you make mistakes, you step up and you announce them. Just don't keep making the same mistake. It's, it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like me, three times. And corporate knowledge. You are responsible for introducing the values and the context of how to be the best organization continuous improvement you are the strategy the vision it is your role to share that that is what you, to bring people on board with that is as a leader it's your role so we've come to the end and that last section as i said will be in your workbook so you will go uh hi there Taylor. Oh, you Catherine, can... there's just one, um, one oh, question? question in the chat from Ian oh, that might be good for you to answer. Where is it? It's more of a you, you question than me. Oh, three new messages. They're right at the bottom. Okay, so when do you share your story and show vulnerability? Yes, you do hold the power, but how do you combat when someone tries to weaponize your story to, to, to try to reduce your power of influence? You choose to let someone reduce your power of influence. You choose to let somebody impact on you. You choose to let that person influence you. If they want to use a weapon to attack you, you choose how you respond. That's the amazing part about the power of choice. Is that you choose. And I know that there are many times when I've been in a situation where I've thought, oh my God, I really could get into, I could, I could win it. I could smash this person. I, because I'm really good with words, having been a teacher, I could go into my teacher role and smash this person to smithereens, despite what they're saying to me. But do I want to do that? 
I choose not to. So whatever it is about who you are and how you want to influence in sits with you. You are the only person that controls. Nobody else can have that impact or effect on you. You choose. And that's the amazing thing is that looking for strategies in order for you to process that, I think is really important. So how do I step away? How do I let go? What are some strategies that I can find that are going to help me understand how to do it? So that's your journey, I think, as an individual looking for ways for you to be the best you can be. Hope that's answered the question. Oops, I'm there. So I have a few questions here. I don't know how we're going for time. We're a few minutes over. Is there anybody got any questions that they'd like to ask? Pop in at the moment, because we're about five minutes over, aren't we? Yep, we've got one more chat here. Have we got one? No? No, okay. So I've just thought I'd put in here some of the questions that I've had asked of me, um, which I think that because of time, we're going to be quite rushed at the moment. But if you want to stay and you've got some questions, happy to stay a little bit longer, up to you. Um, this one, how do I give constructive feedback to the worst performing team members? Whoa. That's an interesting one. My, my answer to that is they don't become the worst performing team members overnight. There are always signs that there is going to be, they're going to be difficult or they're not performing. And the signs or signals or flags, there'll be flag, the first flag, the second flag, and the third flag. If you haven't acted on the third flag, you're lost. You're, in, you're entered into a bus. And often as managers or leaders, we tend to want to avoid those challenging discussions. But if you get it at the first flag and deal with it in a constructive way, then you're more in control of the process of not having it not sort of skyrocket into the worst performing. So as I said, there are flags. If you haven't got the third flag and you haven't addressed it by the third flag, you know you're in trouble, is my little sense. As an introvert, how can I become a person of influence? Is learn, I think, is to find ways for you to be the best you want to be in, in a way that where you shine. So knowing your value and what you're good at. A lot of people think that, you know, introverts can't be people of influence. Yes, they can, but you do it more quietly. So don't determine your success around influencing, engaging and connecting by others, particularly extroverts. Determine, determine your success of influence around on yourself how do you be the best person you can be as a leader how can i seize the moment to be a more effective leader work on yourself work on you be the best you and i guarantee you'll be the best leader so if anyone wants to connect on LinkedIn, do connect with me, uh, follow me. We've got lots of things happening on LinkedIn. We've got courses, we post lots of information to help people to be their best and to move to more. And I love this quote by Maya. I learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that is influence. That's my bit, by the way. <laughs> so, guys, thank you very, 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 very much. As I said, there will be a hand, um, a handout coming through Kerry. We'll send that to you. Fabulous. Thank you for your time, Catherine. It's been a good session, amazing session as always. Some good tips, tips and tricks. Hope everybody has had some value out of the session. And uh, we will place the recording on YouTube as per usual. So um, send that link out and we'll send that with the workbook to all the participants. Have a fabulous day. Speak Thanks soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yes, bye. Good. Just bye.